maybe if people have trouble hearing me at any point, you can send it in the form of a question, and Carolyn, you can alert me, and we'll do what we need to do to make sure that, that it's coming through okay. Uh, as Carolyn said, I'm a, I'm a supervising attorney with the Disability Law Center. Um, that's, uh, the Disability Law Center is a statewide program of a larger legal aid organization, Mid-Minnesota Legal Assistance. Uh, we're somewhat unusual in that respect. Most legal aid offices are regional uh, or geographically limited, and we are statewide. Uh, we get federal funding to work with people uh, with disabilities um, on a wide array of civil legal issues, and we provide a range of advocacy. Uh, we, we do advice uh, onlys, we do full representation, working with individuals or groups of individuals. We do systems uh, and, and policy advocacy, working on task forces and work groups. And uh, we do um, community outreach, parent trainings, webinars like this. Uh, we do a fair amount of legislative advocacy uh, and outreach. So we, we try to have um, uh, an, an impact in a wide variety of ways across the state on a whole host of different types of legal issues that affect people with, with disabilities in Minnesota. Uh, as Carolyn mentioned, I supervise the work of two of our work teams, the Community Services and Integration Team and the Access and Discrimination Team. We also have an Employment Supports Team and a uh, Youth Services Special Education Team. Um, we have our main office in Minneapolis, but we do have um, three regional offices, one in Mankato, one in Duluth, and one up in northwestern Minnesota in Fertile. Um, so we try to get around as much as possible, but webinars like this really help us expand <laughs> our, our reach a bit um, so, that, so that we can uh, get out and about and connect with people as much as possible. Um, I, I think that there's contact information in this PowerPoint that we're going to go through. Certainly, if you have follow-up questions, as Carolyn said, you can connect with uh, Family Voices. You could also call our office if you have individual legal issues or, or uh, concerns that you want to talk with our office about. Um, you should certainly call our intake line. Um, that's probably the best way to do it rather than trying to play telephone tag with me or other direct staff. Our intake line is, is open every day. And I'm going to give you that number. I, I can't remember, honestly, whether we have the number at the end of the PowerPoint or not, but just in case you want to jot it down, our, our intake line is uh, locally 612-334-5970, and there's a toll-free statewide number, 1-800-292-4150. And as a legal aid office, our services are, are free of charge. We are limited to representing the person with a disability on uh, issues related to the disability. Um, so it has to be something um, that has arisen because of the person's disability. The legal issue has to be connected to their disability in some respect. Otherwise, we have a fairly, a fairly broad array of um, areas that we work in, a, a long list of priorities that you can get off of our website. There is a, a link to our website um, towards the end of the PowerPoint. And I imagine if you want to get a copy of the PowerPoint, um, Carolyn can probably make that available to you as well. We don't have any, we don't have any uh, proprietary interest. We'd, we'd certainly like you to, to download it and get a copy of it or circulate it to the extent that you find it helpful. So that's who we are. Um, Carolyn asked me to talk today uh, about a, a, pretty, a pretty broad topic, uh, medical assistance with a focus on home and community-based waiver programs, uh, and then to the extent that it's relevant, some other types of programs that are aimed at, at serving children with disabilities. Um, this is a presentation I've, I've done in one format or another for other organizations as well, uh, and it ranges anywhere from an hour or so at the short end to two or three hours at the long end, depending on how, deep, how much detail we get into and, and how fast I talk, frankly. Um, and I apologize in advance, I do tend to talk too quickly, so hopefully, hopefully I, I'm, I'm coherent today. But if you, if you need me to back up or if you need me to cover something, if something wasn't clear, again, send it as a question and we'll loop back around to it um, towards the end of the presentation. So with that, um, what we're talking about today is, is uh, as I just said, uh, you know, it's the medical assistance program, but um, not all of it. It's going to be a focus on medical assistance as it applies to, to people, particularly children with disabilities. We'll talk about what's available. We'll talk about eligibility, how eligibility gets established for different types of programs, and how you go about uh, applying for those uh, services and programs. And I think, yep, I'm just double checking to make sure that I can control the, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint has um, both general overarching information and, and some very specific information about programs. We'll, we'll um, skim through some of the information because we just don't have time to cover everything in, in excruciating detail, but I wanted to keep it in 
the PowerPoint in case people have questions about it or want to use it as a, a resource down the line. Um, we'll talk about medical assistance. We'll talk about what waivers are. Uh, we're going to try to, to pierce through some of that jargon because uh, social services, the field of social services and uh, uh, health programs is filled with as much jargon as, as every other bureaucratic field. Uh, and so we'll hopefully try to improve our understanding of the vocabulary that's used and what's what and who does what. Um, we'll talk about other related uh, disability services and programs that are available. We'll try to talk about um, you know, what makes you eligible for the different programs. And we'll focus, uh, when, to the extent that we drill down on eligibility, I, I'm going to focus mostly on um, services for people with developmental disabilities, but I appreciate that um, many of your kids might have health issues or other uh, conditions that aren't specifically developmental in nature. And we'll talk about some programs that are not disability specific as well. Uh, again, if you have questions along those lines that, um, that, I, that I only touch on or that we seem to be skirting around, you can certainly submit that question. We'll try to get to it before we end today. And then we'll talk about um, how, you, how you can try to access these services. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about context, about the, uh, the big picture. Um, first of all, there are a lot of places that you can go. When you, when you run into um, questions or, or uh, programs or, or uh, uh, issues that you'd like to get more information about, you don't really know where to turn, there are certainly organizations like ours, like Family Voices, like Disability Law Center, ARC Minnesota and Great, Greater Twin Cities, PACER, uh, NAMI. Some of them are... Um, uh, broader in their scope, some of them are, are disability specific, but all of them are good resources uh, and places to reach out to both online and, and directly through their advocates. Um, in Minnesota, as you probably know at this point, um, we're, we're a heavily county-based social services system, which means that we rely on counties, county staff people, case managers, intake workers, to do a lot of the day-to-day -day administration of our social service programs. The state of Minnesota might um, might create the program, they might uh, apply to the federal government to run a certain program such as medical assistance, they might create policy for the program, uh, and they might manage it overall, but they don't administer it on a day-to-day on a -day basis, they don't do most of the intake or eligibility determinations. For that, they depend largely on uh, staff at the county uh, agency level. And we'll talk about that more as we go through and, and what that means and, and how that impacts you and um, how, how you can use that information to get to where you need to go. Um, let's talk a little bit about funding and, and where the money comes from. So money obviously comes from different levels. The federal government kicks in money for disability related programs. Uh, the state of Minnesota has its own state funding that goes to pay for various programs. There are some programs that are created and, and funded at the local level, whether city or uh, more frequently the county level. And then there's obviously private insurance and private pay. And there's some interaction in some of these programs among all of these. And for purposes of eligibility, you oftentimes need to jump through certain types of hoops to, to show that you're eligible uh, for you're not receiving services through one system, you're only getting through another system. Um, to the extent that that matters, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll try to flag that um, as we go. But let's talk about the big one. Uh, Medicaid is the federal program that was created in the 60s, and it's certainly getting a fair amount of play these days because every time they talk about uh, repealing and replacing Obamacare, what's lurking behind those discussions is um, our changes to Medicaid because what funds an awful lot of both the health care in this country and uh, disability-related programs is Medicaid. It's called medical assistance um, in Minnesota. It pays for, as this slide shows, uh, health care for a, a, a wide group of people, low-income families with children, the elderly, and persons with disabilities. Those are the target groups, the primary target groups uh, that Medicaid aims to serve. It's the biggest funding source for disability services in the country. And by disability services, I mean both what we think of as typical health care or health insurance and also long-term care. And we'll talk about examples of those things. Um, it's, a, it's a jointly run, uh, cooperatively funded program. And the amount of money that the feds put into it depends uh, on state demographics. The more wealthy states kick in a higher percentage of the uh, cost of, of coverage and 
uh, states with lower um, per capita income get a higher federal split. Minnesota is a, a more wealthy state. They get, in general, the highest federal states uh, split in terms of the state percentage. They, it's a 50-50 split. Other states like Mississippi, it's as much as 75 to 80 percent federal money as opposed to state money. Um, there are specific areas in Medicaid where the federal government in recent years has, has ponied up more money. Uh, under the Affordable, Affordable Care Act, what, what we call Obamacare, there were um, incentives built in to get states to add to their, to their Medicaid population, what's called Medicaid expansion, to cover um, people who are otherwise uninsured. Uh, the largest group were uninsured single adults. And as an incentive for the state to expand their Medicaid coverage to cover those individuals, um, the feds kicked in more money, significantly more. Um, and that's one of the battles that's going on in Congress right now, whether, whether that increased federal uh, share makes sense or not. But that's the, those are the basics. States don't have to participate in Medicaid. It's ultimately an optional program. Every state does because it, you'd be passing up free, free money if you don't. And, you know, every, state, every state's residents send money through taxes to the federal government, and this is one way of getting some of that money back to help cover a basic social need, which is... Um, healthcare coverage and, and long-term care for, for these groups of people in their state. So every state has a Medicaid program. What's in it can vary from state to state. The federal template has a list of 20 plus service types that every Medicaid program has to include. But within Medicaid, there are a lot of optional types of services that a state may choose or not. And that's up to the state. It's up to the state to decide how much they wanna pay, what the alternatives are, um, how much they can afford to pay. So how do you become eligible for medical assistance? Well, for persons, because it covers different groups, there are different eligibility screens. Um, and if we focus specifically on eligibility for persons with disabilities, there are two basic uh, sets of questions that they ask to determine your eligibility. One is, what's the nature of your disability? Do you meet the disability standards of the Social Security Income Program? And those are both um, functional and categorical in nature. So if you have certain types of disabilities, you can automatically qualify. But if you have just a, um, a combination of uh, health conditions or uh, disabling conditions, and those, those, that combination of, of conditions significantly functionally limits you, um, you can qualify under the functional limitation standard for Social Security Income Program and meet the disability standards for medical assistance. Um, that's the one set of questions they ask. And that, how do you answer those questions? Mostly with medical records. You know, a pediatrician will write a, will write a, a letter that, that supports it, or you'll get diagnostic information and submit it. But there are also financial uh, questions, because medical assistance was created primarily as a low-income assistance health insurance program. Um, and so the general rule of thumb is you have to meet certain income and asset standards or restrictions. You have to be low-income. If you don't meet those standards, you can't qualify for medical assistance. That's the general rule. And as many of you, if we were all in the same room today, this is where I'd ask how many people's children are on medical assistance. But if your kids are already on medical assistance, you probably know that there are exceptions to the general rule. And we'll talk about the one uh, uh, in particular that applies to kids. And it's what we refer to as the TEFRA option uh, or the TEFRA exception. TEFRA is just a budgetary acronym. But TEFRA is how you can get medical assistance for children with disabilities whose family's income and assets would otherwise disqualify them from medical assistance coverage. You have too much in assets or, or the parents make too much money or the child, him or herself, has too many assets to otherwise be eligible for medical assistance, but they have a disabling condition, um, a chronic health care condition, and we want to get them medical assistance coverage. So under the TEFRA option, we waive certain financial restrictions or, or requirements that would otherwise apply and we allow the child to be covered, the child, not necessarily the family, but the child to be covered under medical assistance. And this just identifies the, the basic eligibility requirements for TEFRA. Child's gotta be under 18, meet those disability standards we talked about. The child has to have a significant level of care, an institutional level of care. And there are different types of institutions um, or institutional levels of care that can qualify you. A hospital is a fairly high level. A nursing home is a relatively lower level that focuses mostly on physical uh, conditions or mental and or mental health conditions. There's also the ICFDD level of care, which is um, an intermediate care facility for people with developmental disabilities. It's the old or historic 
traditional institutional setting for people with developmental disabilities, and it focuses on their developmental delay, cognitive functioning issues. Um, and if you meet those basic requirements, then they ask uh, what is the family income and or assets that are available. If they can exceed regular medical assistance requirements, with the understanding would, that you, you'd pay a parental fee. There's a buy-in, basically. In order to offset um, the expense of covering a larger group of people, we ask the family that has the income or assets to pay a parental fee um, and still have their child qualify for medical assistance. That's the basic idea or the basic deal that you get through the TEFRA option. Um, TEFRA covers children with a, with a wide array of uh, disabilities or chronic health conditions. It's not just kids with DD. Again, you look at the SSI disability standards, which, which can cover both categorical disabilities and functional, uh, functional issues. It also does cover um, a number of children with significant uh, mental health needs and limitations related to those needs. Okay. Um, Carolyn, I should say that if, if questions do pop up and you think it makes sense for me to address it because I'm, you know, I've, I've gotten off track or somebody has a question about something that I just said or didn't hear me, just let me know and I'll, and I'll backtrack as, as, as might be helpful. Okay. One, so one, for those, question that yep. just, oh, one question that just came up is how long does the SMIRT process usually take? Okay, so that's what this slide just gets to. Um, it, it's varied. Um, I would say that based on the calls we get, too long. It takes too long. Um, it, can, it can be done as, as quickly as oh, four or five weeks. Um, the basic process is that you gather information. You go into the county. The county will say, in order to get access to certain types of programs or in order to establish your eligibility for medical assistance, we need this documentation. And they have a checklist. Uh, you can, I don't have a copy of this or a link to it, but if you Googled DHS Minnesota, SMIRT TEFRA checklist, you would, you would find it. Um, it's a one-page checklist. They're looking for medical records, diagnostic information. They will accept school records that help, that, 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 uh, that talk about, um, for example, special education standards and services provided as a way of explaining uh, the child's functional limitations or service needs. Um, the county, what, what's problematic about the process is that the county's just a, uh, just a pass-through. So you give the information to the county, they pass it on to the state medical review team, which is a subset, of, it's a department within the Department of Human Services at the state level that reviews the documentation you send in. It's the state medical review team. They've got various professionals that review that, that documentation and determine whether you meet the disability standards or not. The county at the same time will look at the financial information. The financial people at the county will look at the financial information. Um, the problem, problems that arise is when you don't have a categorical disability that they can just easily check the box off and they have additional questions. You know, they, they look at some of the documents and they're not quite sure. They don't tend to have a, an efficient process where they call you up and, and get you to answer yes or no or tell you exactly what the piece of paper is that they need to see. They go back to the county. The county then t calls you up. It's, a, it's like a game of telephone and there's oftentimes, there are oftentimes gaps or miscommunication in that process that can lead to you know, prolonged delays. I've seen SMIRT decisions take nine months to a year where you know, bureaucracy just gets in the way. Typically, it takes a couple of months. If it's an emergency, the county will usually try to let that be known, and, it, and I think it's like in every system, there's a way to sort of push that application to the top of the pile. Um, but yeah, it, bureaucracy being what it is, it, it really, you, should, you should plan on it taking a couple of months probably start to finish. Um, so that's TEFR, as I said, you know, the, the deal with TEFR is, you know, family pays a parental fee. It's based on a, a sliding scale. There's a link here um, to the worksheet. So if, you're, if you haven't started the process but you're wondering what would that parental fee look like, um, you can use this worksheet to get to it. The deal with, with the parental fee is you, you're never obligated to pay more with your parental fee than the uh, cost or billing for the services that you receive. So if you, if you apply for medical assistance, you, you, you're determined eligible, your child's covered, but you don't use it all that often. You use it for some doctor's visits um, and you're not really getting ongoing daily uh, or long-term care and it turns out you've been paying a parental fee of pick a number, $500 a month, 
and that's way over the cost of the services you receive, there's a settle up process at the end of at the end of the year and you can get reimbursed the amount that exceeded the, the cost or, or billing for the services that you receive. That's another sort of bureaucratic financial management headache that, that a lot of people decide they don't need because they're not going to use um, medical assistance for significant care. You really have to decide why it is that you're applying for medical assistance. Is it because of some ongoing therapy need that your private insurance doesn't cover, for example, or long-term care services? that your private insurance doesn't cover or has very limited coverage for. If that's the case, then it oftentimes becomes financially wise to, to get your child onto medical assistance. But you have to identify what is it that, that you're going for in terms of the services or coverage that you're not currently getting and what's the value of that. And then weigh it against what the likely parental fee would be. Just a separate note here on a question that pops up oftentimes, the fees that you do pay should be tax deductible um, for those of you who, who are um, you know, filling out your tax returns, it's, it's considered a medical expense. There's, a, there's an IRS uh, FAQ on that that uh, went around a few years ago. Uh, it also can be reimbursable through an employer's flex benefits plan. And that's something you should talk with your employer about if, if that were an issue. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that there were two exceptions to the, to the requirement that you be low income. The first was TEFRA. The second is what's called MAEPD. I'm not going to go through this really, but just to flag it as a term, MAEPD is medical assistance for employed persons with disabilities. And it's a way of people who have a disability, need medical assistance, oftentimes need long-term care and supports, but are capable of working and want to work, of maintaining eligibility for medical assistance and not getting kicked off because they're over income or because they have too many assets. It allows you to work. It allows you to have income. It allows you to have um, a certain amount of assets. And much like TEFRA, you pay a sliding fee scale to, to stay on it, to, to maintain it as your insurance. But we'll skip through that. If people have more questions about that, you can certainly read through the slides. We've got uh, detail of the, of the requirements, um, what it means to be working and, and what you pay and what the limitations are. Uh, but I won't cover that right now because that tends to be something that becomes more of an issue when you hit your 20s. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about medical assistance and, and what types of stuff it actually covers. We've talked about it as a health insurance program. What does that mean? Every state that has medical assistance submits to the federal government what's called the state medical assistance plan. And that documents the types of the categories of services that are covered by medical assistance, um, both the ones that are required or mandatory under federal law and also the ones that the state uh, chooses, the optional services that the state chooses to cover. And it details you know, to whom those services are available and what amounts. Um, but they fall into some basic categories. And, and the main categories that a medical assistance plan has to cover are the ones that are listed here. Healthcare, what we traditionally think of in terms of health insurance and he basic uh, healthcare, doctor visits, hospitalizations, specific types of therapies, some dental coverage, although medical assistance tends to have lousy dental coverage, uh, therapies like occupational therapy or speech therapy. That's one category of service. Most of those are required uh, to be offered in some form or to some degree under federal law. The second set of, of um, services that are provided through medical assistance plans are what are called uh, medical assistance home care services. And that covers home care nursing, what used to be called private duty nursing, uh, nurses who come into your home and provide nursing care in the home, home health aides, personal care assistance, and we'll talk more about personal care assistance for uh, PCA services, rehab services, skilled nursing visits. Those are um, a, a category of care under medical assistance under the Medicaid uh, statute that are referred to as home care services. And then um, what Medicaid refers to as durable medical equipment, assistive technology and supplies. DME, durable medical equipment, includes things like communication devices, wheelchairs, assistive technology um, can be a wide array of things from computer software to um, to braces, to all kinds of things that help you uh, interact with others and your physical environment. Um, and then certain types of uh, medical equipment and supplies are also covered, usually in a limited amount, and those, that amount is specified in the state plan. That's the type of thing that you're getting uh, when, you, when you apply for and get covered by medical assistance. Let's drill down a little bit, though, on one of those home care services that is a fundamental safety net service. Most states, uh, in fact, I think every state offers some form of personal care assistance services. Um, and this is a long-term care and support service uh, program 
that frankly is very poorly funded by most uh, private insurance policies. Most private insurance policies, to the extent that they pay or cover any amount of PCA, they do so in a very limited sort of rehab uh, fashion. If you get into a car accident and you need assistance doing uh, basic um, activities, what are called activities of daily living, you'll get a time-limited amount or uh, an hour amount of PCA, and then that's it. That doesn't particularly help if you have a chronic health condition or a disability that requires ongoing assistance, long-term assistance. And for that, a lot of people will turn to their state medical assistance program and try to get access to it as a way of getting funding for coverage of personal care assistance. So, what are, what are PCA services? They are generically described as services that are planned, they're provided pursuant to a written plan of care, they're home-based, that means the staff person comes into your home to provide the services. They're medically oriented uh, in that they address the impact of a medical condition or disability, although they're not medical in nature. Um, but they are services that are necessary to help a person function within the home and community. They cover and are available uh, to serve people who have a wide array of disabilities or health, chronic health conditions. So again, not just people with de a developmental disability, but many different types of uh, disabilities. And they are performed by uh, what we call per PCAs, personal care assistants. Um, they, they cover two basic types of assistance. Um, assistance that helps a person engage in activities of daily living, or ADLs, and assistance that helps a person engage in IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living. And those two are defined here. The, the ADLs are the more important ones because the amount of PCA service that you ultimately will be determined to be eligible for and receive are based on your ADL needs, your ability to show that you have functional limitations that create a dependency in these areas. You have an inability to dress yourself groom yourself, bathe, eat, toilet, um, engage in bowel or bladder care or skin care, um, transfer from one, uh, from you know, sitting to standing or from one location to another, ambulate, move from you know, across, uh, across your house into and outside of your house, um, and certain types of other uh, complex health cares, including uh, respiratory services. If you have a chronic health condition or a disabling condition, that, that, means, that makes it impossible for you to engage in these activities independently, in other words, creates a dependency in these areas, you can qualify for PCA services. And there is a PCA assessment form that goes through and asks the extent to which you are dependent in these areas and has certain standards that they apply to determine whether you're dependent in those areas. If you're determined eligible for and you get an authorization for PCA services, they will help you engage in those areas that you have been found dependent. They can also be used to help you engage in the second category, IADLs. You just don't get additional time. So if you get three hours a day because of your needs for help with dressing, toileting, bathing, eating, you can, you, the PCA who comes to help you can also help you do some of these other things, shop for food, um, buy clothing, uh, manage your bank account, make phone appointments. They just don't get extra time. For that. So they have to sort of fill in that with the time that they have allocated to, to meet your other um, ADL needs. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's a way of saying we're not, it's not a game of gotcha. Once they're there in your home, they can help you with these other issues, but for purposes of deciding how much time you get, we only look at the ADLs. Um, oh, I can't, I'm trying to fast forward. Okay, here we go. Um, they are, this is just more description of, of the PCA services and how they work. Um, let me skip through here to how you actually get PCA services. As, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, we are um, a county administered service uh, system when it comes to social services. So you go to the county social services office. Uh, you ask it for an assessment. To the extent that you can tell when you walk through the county door, I'm looking for this type of service or this program, that can be helpful. Um, in small counties with, with fewer staff people, you know, one staff person will wear many hats and won't necessarily remember all of the programs that you might be eligible for. So if you can, if you, can uh, you know, turn on that light or ring that bell for them, that can be helpful. In larger counties where they've got thousands of, of, of different offices and, and they really drill down and become fairly specialized, you don't want to end up in the wrong office with the wrong person. We have a way of trying to deal with that that we've developed over the last handful of years. 
um, in terms of assessment tools available. But for PCA services, there are two basic tools that exist out there to determine, to use to assess your eligibility, your child's eligibility for PCA services. The one is what they call the leg a legacy tool. It's the original PCA assessment, about a 10-page document. Um, it exists in hard copy. You can find it on the DHS website. Um, and it just walks through all the categories that they assess um, for, for determining whether you could be eligible for PCA services. That's still being used uh, by some counties for some people. It, has, it is supposed to be replaced. It is already um, supposed to have been replaced uh, statewide uh, by a new assessment tool that some of you may have already come into contact with called the Min Choices Assessment, uh, which is a different software-based uh, assessment that, tool that, that asks a, a really broad range of questions, personal background questions, um, diagnostic information, health information, um, service needs, uh, reasons for, for asking for assessments. They really want to try to get a, a person-centered, comprehensive view of who you are, why you're in the office today, what you're looking for, what activities you, you have difficulty engaging in, you want to engage in, and ultimately what kinds of services and programs you might be eligible for. It, it, is, it gathers this information and, and can assess your eligibility for about a dozen different programs, including, including the PCA program. And we'll talk a little bit more about Min Choices uh, and the assessment process later. But in most instances, if you go into the county, even if you say, I want to be, um, I want to get on medical assistance or I'm already on medical assistance and I'd like to be assessed or screened for PCA services, they'll use the Min Choices assessment to do that. These, these assessments are created um, and set up in such a way as to be used in the, to be taken out and about into the community by the assessors and to be used in your home. If you're in a nursing facility trying to get out, they, they go to where you are um, so they can do it in your home as opposed to you going to a clinic or going into the county to have it done. Um, that's PCA. I wanted to talk a little bit about we're, we're heading towards other types of waiver services that the, where we're at now is we're talking our other types of MA services. We're talking about different types of MA services right now. Um, and so these, these slides are somewhat topical in nature. What we just finished talking about was the PCA program, a basic safety net program that's available to a lot of people, that tends to be uh, an entry type service. People who go into, who get uh, medical assistance eligibility and who have um, a disability that affects their, their functioning, their functional abilities, they will oftentimes establish medical assistance eligibility specifically to get access to PCA services because it's not a cap service. There's no, in terms of a uh, number of people can be served, there's no waiting list to get access to PCA services. Uh, the, the ability to find staff to provide PCA assistance is relatively easy. I say relatively easy because to be a PCA, you don't have to, you don't have, to have a lot of qualifications. Um, you, know, you have to be 16 years old or older. You can't have created a, or committed a felony you know, or be otherwise barred from providing direct services to individuals with disabilities and other vulnerable populations. Um, but by and large, there are a lot of PCA agencies out there, uh, and you can even bypass the formal agency uh, process and self-direct PCA services. Use a, um, an agency just to process the billing and hire the PCAs yourself. So if you had a cousin or a neighbor who you wanted to be able to pay to provide disability-related care to your child as a PCA, there's a program to do that, PCA choice. And there aren't a lot of other hoops that you have to jump through. So that's why we talk about PCA at the outset, just to give people an understanding. That's one of those safety net um, sort of lower level but more generally available service types that, that, are, that, that are available to people in, in Minnesota who are medical assistance eligible. Another type of service, though, that I just wanted to flag for people, I don't know how many people here have kids who are on the autism spectrum, but this is a service that was a decade in development, and it's still not quite as up and running as it could be because of a, a shortage of providers and difficulty in, in bureaucratic difficulties in providers developing a billing structure to, to pay for the services that are available. But it's called, I don't know how they pronounce it in all honesty, EIDBI, uh, Early Inter Intensive Developmental and Behavioral Intervention Benefit. This is a new benefit that's available under medical assistance and under Minnesota Care. Um, to people who qualify for either program. I haven't talked about Minnesota Care, but that's a gap filler. For people who are not medical assistance eligible, um, 
who have jobs but whose income is below a certain level. I, I don't remember what it is. It's in the low to mid-20s, uh, 20,000 range. Um, Minnesota Care is a state-funded insurance program to help provide insurance coverage to people who can't get access to private health care, aren't otherwise eligible uh, for medical assistance, but still need to have basic medical insurance and want to get access to some of these uh, other longer-term supports. And so we have some additional uh, services like this new, new EIDBI benefit that's available to people who are also on Minnesota Care. So what is EIDBI? It's, it's, it's spelled out here. Um, it targets people who, who have an ASD diagnosis uh, or a similar diagnosis. The eligibility criteria are spelled out. Um, the, the key to this is that it's not a county-driven assessment process. You have to go through an eligible provider, a provider that is enrolled to conduct what are called these CMDEs, these comprehensive multidisciplinary evaluations. And there are providers locally, there are providers like Frazier um, that focus on providing services to kids with autism. They are, um, they are certified to do these CMDEs. And they do the assessment. If they find that you are, are or should be eligible for this benefit, they fill out that form. And with that, you can take it, submit it to the state, and get uh, an authorization for a certain level or access to this benefit program. This is a, a heavily provider-driven system, so you really need to find a provider first, have that provider explain the types of services and supports they could give to you and your child, you know, communication program, uh, what kind of intensive treatment, either individualized or in a small group setting, your child might benefit from, work on behaviors, work on uh, other maladaptive um, issues, improve functioning, um, social interactions and communication, what kind of treatment and services the provider would provide, get them to fill out the CMDE, and then in a cir somewhat circular way, get approval for that provider to go ahead and start providing those services. Um, what does it cover? It covers, as I, as I just suggested, various types of individual and group interventions or treatments. It covers um, a variety of family and caregiver training and education. And it also helps with care coordination. It, it, it creates a comprehensive care team that helps bring together the various entities that might be in your child's life, school, pediatrician's office, um, county social services, and coordinate the efforts that each of those entities is doing to make sure that we have a treatment plan in place that can cross environments and staff and, and service types and be consistent with the individual's needs. You know, not have different agencies and different staff people working across purposes. Um, so that kind of coordination can be helpful. A lot of programs, you know, treat their programs as insular, and that's not particularly helpful when you've got um, a child who, frankly, needs to have a more consistent, reliable, comprehensive plan of care in place. So broadly speaking, that's that benefit. I don't have a lot of other detail to share with you. If people actually want to get more information about that, that's, that's the type of thing where we could get you access to other information, providers who, are, who could be helpful along those lines, other details about that. But I wanted to flag it because it's a relatively new benefit um, that's only been around for the past few years. Okay, so let's get to what was supposed to be kind of a, a central topic um, of this presentation, medical assistance waivers. Um, what are they? What do they cover? Who gets them? How do you get them? Waivers are called waivers uh, because they allow states, they're an optional program that states can have as part of their overall medical assistance program um, and offer to individuals who would qualify for them that allows the states to waive, uh, ignore, you know, sort of get around what would be typical medical assistance requirements. They allow states to provide services that you might historically only have been able to get in an institutional setting. And they do that to help states help individuals get out of or avoid placement in institutional settings. We don't want people to be un unnecessarily institutionalized in a hospital or a nursing facility or an intermediate care facility if they don't need to be. If they can receive services and supports that help them stay in the family home, help them remain in their communities and access their communities, that's what we want to do. And waivers are one of the primary vehicles that we use to try to uh, minimize the need for or um, avoid placement in institutional settings. They allow um, 
states to provide additional services that wouldn't otherwise be covered under regular medical assistance. Different types of um, equipment, different types of uh, direct staffing care like respite care, things that aren't part of the standard menu of services under the state medical assistance plan, but which can be built into the waiver programs and help meet disability related needs. And then they allow states to target either certain uh, disability populations or, people, or populations with chronic health conditions or geographic populations. You know, if the state of California wanted to have a waiver to serve a certain group of people in Orange County, they can do it. You can limit it geographically. In Minnesota, we don't. In Minnesota, we have a handful of waivers, four of which are disability waivers. Uh, and this is the list. There's the DD waiver, the brain injury waiver, the CADI waiver, and the CAC waiver. And CADI and CAC are are acronyms that stand for uh, Community Access for Disability Inclusion and Community Alternative Care. Each one of these waivers uh, has its own set of eligibility requirements. All of them require that the person have some kind of disability or combination of disabilities and meet a certain specified level of care because each of these waivers is set up, again, to help people get out of an institutional setting or avoid the institutional setting. And when the state asks the federal government to run one of these waiver programs, it makes basic assurances to the feds. It says all of these people will need this level of care. It says that the people who we put on the waiver are people who would otherwise be at risk of institutionalization, for whom we would therefore pay um, you know, to have services or receive services in that institutional setting. And we promise to meet the people's health and safety needs in their communities with these waiver services we promise to, ha to provide these services pursuant to written plan of care, and we promise not to pay more for the, for the cost of these services, either individually or in the aggregate, the state can pick, uh, than we would if all of these individuals who are on the waiver were otherwise in the institutional setting. So if you have 1,000 people in a nursing facility that you really want to get out because you think they can be better served in the family home or in their communities, and you open up a uh, waiver to meet those needs, you would assess the eligibility by looking at their level of care need and say, well, they all meet the nursing facility level of care need because they're all in the nursing facility right now. Um, and then you would also look at, for some of these waivers, whether they have the right kind of disability uh, or combination of disabilities. In Minnesota, these four, these four waivers um, represent kind of the spectrum in that respect. Two of them are disability specific, the DD waiver and the brain injury waiver. For the DD waiver, you have to be a person with a developmental disability or a related condition. And we're going to talk a little bit about more, more about that in a second. For the brain injury waiver, you have to be a person who has uh, a history of, who has experienced a brain injury and a brain injury that causes the functional limitations or the need for services that are available under the waiver. And there's a specific assessment uh, a set of questions or tool that they use to determine that. If you have a developmental disability or a brain injury, you can qualify for those waivers as long as your functional limitations are significant enough, your need for services are significant enough, that it meets the level of care need applicable to those waivers. And for the DD waiver, we talked about this before, but it's an intermediate care facility level of need. They look at the extent to which your developmental delays or cognitive issues um, impair your functioning. Uh, and if it does so deeply and broadly enough, to meet that, the, the institutional level of care, then you're eligible for the DD waiver. For the brain injury waiver, we actually, it's a split waiver. There's a hospital level of care and a nursing facility, a lower level nursing facility level of care. And if you meet either one of those, you can get access to the waiver, um, the brain injury waiver. The other two are not disability specific. The CADI waiver is a nursing facility level of care. And much like we were talking about for establishing uh, medical assistance eligibility, going through the SMERT team and just getting signed up for medical assistance. Here, you just need to show that you have a combination of uh, disabilities or chronic health conditions that would require the level of care provided in a nursing facility. It's primarily looking at physical disability issues, but not entirely. It also looks at behavioral, associated behavioral issues, cognitive issues, and mental health issues. And any combination of those uh, the right combination of those that meets a level of care provided in a nursing facility can get you access to the CADI waiver. The CAC waiver is similar, it's just a hospital level of care, so you need a higher level of nursing, daily nursing interventions or have a condition that would likely lead to repeated hospitalizations in order to get up to the CAC level of care. 
you can tell by this discussion that um, these are all not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can be eligible for more than one waiver. Um, and, and sometimes it, sometimes it benefits you to get access to one waiver or another. There's a fair amount of overlap in the types of services that are offered. All of these waivers, for example, offer some kind of direct care staffing. You can get PCA services and extended PCA services, additional PCA services through all of these waivers. You can get respite care. You can do modifications to your home. So if you needed to get a ramp built to, to your door in order for your child in a wheelchair to get in and out of the house, you can do all of those types of things under these waivers. They all offer transportation assistance to get you in and about the community. But they also all have their own unique services. There are specific cognitive um, therapies available under the brain injury waiver that are not included in the other waivers because they target the needs, the, the therapy related needs um, for people who have experienced brain injury. And they don't assume that if you're on the CADI waiver, for example, that's a particular need of yours. Um, Similarly, with the DD waiver, there, there are a number of services under the DD waiver that are aimed at meeting a person's developmental needs, or what they call habilitative needs. And that's a set of needs, um, functional related needs that are not unique to, but that are specific to a person with a developmental disability, and they don't assume, if you're on these other waivers, that you have those needs. They're not part of the level of care for those institutional settings. So there are some services you can get under the DD waiver that you cannot get under the CADI waiver. Um, is that important? Well, it's important if you need those services. We'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. And if anybody has that kind of issue, if anybody has a child who's already gone through all of this process and is being served right now under the CADI waiver, but is wondering whether your child who does have a developmental disability should be, should be served under the DD waiver or would be, would be better served under the DD waiver, that's the kind of issue that our office sees on a fairly frequent basis, and, and we would have some advice for you along those lines. Um, we can certainly follow up with you if that's the kind of question uh, that you have. Okay, that's waivers very broadly. Let's focus now on, on one of them, the DD waiver, to just tease out the details of it a little bit. The DD waiver is a pretty large waiver, and by large I mean it, we currently serve over 15,000 people in the state of Minnesota uh, on the DD waiver. To give you some sense of what we're talking about, the, the, the DD waiver is a package of services and supports. You, when you get onto the waiver, they create a written plan of care. And you get access, as we'll see, to a menu of services um, which you have some degree of choice in receiving. You need to be eligible for each service type. They're not going to give you a service that your child doesn't actually need. But if your child does need it, you can get access to that service or support within an overall budget that the county will help you create. We'll talk about how budgets get created in a little bit as well. The total cost of care can vary greatly. There are some people on the DD waiver who use relatively few services. Uh, maybe they just get PCA services and respite care, which is you know, periodic care to give relief to the primary caregivers, to mom and dad. Uh, and maybe they use it to get some, some nominal supplies and equipment. Their overall budget in a given year might be, say, $28,000 a year. I'm just pulling that out of a hat on the, on the lower end. There are people on the DD waiver whose kids not only have a developmental disability, but complex medical needs um, and significant behavioral issues, and their budgets are well into the six figures. Um, there are people who are served, there are adults with significant health needs, developmental delay, and behavioral issues who need one-on-one -on -one staffing, highly intensive care, um, and whose budgets can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, it, and if absent those services, they go into um, highly restrictive, highly intensive institutional settings. There's no specific budget cap, individual budget cap generally on the DD waiver. You meet with the county, the county comes up with a reasonable package of services aimed at meeting your needs. Um, the counties usually have guidelines to make sure that they're equitable uh, client to client so that one client, two clients with similar needs don't get drastically different service packages or budgets. Um, but the key, again, is for the state to be able to say in the aggregate, these 15,000 plus people who are being served do not cost the federal government more to serve than they would if they were in the institutional setting. The average cost, though, of serving a person in, in an intermediate care facility, I haven't looked at the number really recently, it's somewhere around $75,000 a year, average per person. 
The DD waiver is less than that. It's somewhere in the $65,000 range. So there's a significant savings overall to the state to having these individuals receive waiver services as opposed to ICF services. Um, so how does it work? Well, they, these budgets are created by combining the federal money and the state money into um, an overall uh, appropriated amount of funds that DHS, the Department of Human Services at the state level manages, and which they carve up into um, allocation pools, an aggregate amount of money that they make available to each lead agency or county um, to serve the people in their county. And so it's almost like a line of credit. DHS will say to St. Louis County, based on the number of people you have on the waiver and your waiting list and the new resources we have, your total waiver budget is X amount of money, $22 million. And you've got to serve the 892 people in your county and whoever else you can serve within that aggregate amount. Uh, you can't exceed that amount. But you guys decide, you meet with the recipients, you decide what their service plans, you authorize the services, and you make sure that the total amount of the services you authorize and ultimately providers bill for don't exceed the amount that we've allocated to you. And then the providers bill for those services and DHS and the counties manage that to make sure they don't exceed what the legislature and, and the federal government has said they'll, they're willing to spend on the program. As I said, everybody has a written plan of care. So you know what services you're authorized to receive, you know what the amount is that you're authorized to receive. Every county does it in its own somewhat unique way. Some counties really work tightly within a global budget. They tell you, you can't, you've got a budget of $28,000, now let's put your services together and make sure we don't ex exceed that. Other counties put your services together, add it all up and determine, all right, is this too much? Do we need to cut back somewhere? Or is this okay? It's, it's a little bit more of an organic ground up process as opposed to a budget driven top down process. But anyway, you get to it. At, at the beginning of the waiver year, you have your service plan in place. You know what types of services and supports you're authorized to receive. Some of them might be items like you're buying adaptive computer software or adaptive clothing or you know, you're doing a home modification or a vehicle modification. It's a specific amount uh, tailored for that item of support. And some of it's staffing. I'm hoping to get 10 hours of PCA a week and six hours a month of respite care and some transportation services. And we're going to monitor that as we go because sometimes staff doesn't show up and so you're underspending. Sometimes, you know, a health condition flares up and you need to get some additional uh, care and you need to move money around. That's part of the process you go through is, uh, is communicating with your county as needs change or modulate across the service year. And if you need to get an increase or, an access, or access to a different type of services, there's a process at every county for you to change or add to, if appropriate, the service plan that's in place. But you always know what your target is, and you're always trying to stay within that target so that the county can add all of it together and make sure that they're not overspending overall in the program. Individually and globally, that's kind of how the waiver administratively works. Um, what kind of services are we getting? This is This is... Uh, probably not quite exhaustive list, but it has most of the types of services that are available under the DD waiver. And you can just eyeball and see the different types of services and supports there are. Some of them are direct care staffing. Some of them are basic supports like transportation or respite care some of, or PCA care. Some of them are more, are more detailed or specific to a particular type of outcome like supported employment. Um, some of them are in the nature of uh, equipment or supplies. Um, but they really try to identify what are your needs throughout the day and across environments so that we have a 24-hour plan of care and so that your basic health, safety, and welfare needs can be uh, assured while you work towards obtaining certain goals, you know, developing your vocational skills in such a way so that you can move from school through a transition program and ultimately into a competitively paying job. So you need some employment supports, that kind of thing. There are, and if people have specific questions about specific services, again, we can talk about that towards the end. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of time, and Carolyn, you, you give me the, the heads up when we're getting close to when you want to have me stop talking and when you want me to have us start addressing some of the questions. Um, but I wanted to point out that once you get onto a waiver, there are two basic ways of um, accessing and managing the services, that are, services and supports that are available to you. The standard way 
is for you to sit down with the case manager. The case manager has the service plan form. The case manager has done that min choices assessment, has a good idea of who you are, who your, who your child is, what your child's um, conditions are, what sort of service needs the child has, and they try to match them up, okay? The child has difficulty interacting with other people. They have some behavioral issues. We need some, we need some staffing support in the home. We want that staffing support to be relatively skilled to be able to work on this behavioral uh, program that school is working on, to be able to work on these communication skills. So while we need some PCA care to deal with some of those activities of daily living, we also need a higher level of care. So they authorize in-home family supports, and they find you a provider with some trained staff that can be paid a little bit more than a PCA would get paid to work on a communication program. But then we also need, and what, the, so what they do is identify all those specific types of service supports. They help you try to identify provider agencies that provide those services and supports, and they have you make contact with those provider agencies and pick a provider agency that hires the staff and sends the staff to your home to work with your child. That's the traditional model. That's how waiver services have historically worked and still work for a large number of people in the system. There has been developed over the last dozen years or so an alternative model, a more self-directed model that gives you, the, the parent or the individual on the waiver, much more control over, flexibility over, and ultimately responsibility for the, the, the service plan development and the um, hiring of staff and the management of your overall service plan. And that model under the waivers is called CDCS, Consumer Directed Community Supports. It's not a separate program, it's not a separate waiver, it's a way of getting waiver services. Um, it's an optional way, a different way, a more self-directed way of planning for and receiving services under each of those four disability waivers, as well as a couple of other programs that offer the CDCS option. How does this work? Well, in exchange for giving you much more flexibility for defining the types of service and supports you want, it's not quite as categorical. You don't have to fit it into one of those boxes, those waiver services boxes. If we go back that one slide. Each of these is our, are a specific service type. They have specific definitions. If you want to use it, your service type and the provider has to fit within each one of those. It has to be a supported employment provider who qualifies um, to provide supported employment by meeting a provider definition. It has to be adult daycare and fall within adult daycare's definition. Under consumer directed community supports, there are only four broad categories of service, personal assistance, treatment and training, administrative support, and environmental modifications um, and supports. And within those four broad categories, you get to define the actual service type. You can call a person a behavioral aid and that person could look a little like a PCA, but not be pigeonholed into, into only helping with activities of daily living. You could po and focus more on behavioral issues. You could call a person a communication assistance, and, and really what that person is is a person with background on, on developing communication. It might be a speech pathologist or, um, or an occupational therapist and, and uh, speech path who is gonna work with your child's, uh, develop your child's communication needs. And you can define that specific type of personal assistance or treatment and training and define the provider qualifications and then go out and hire that person within broad parameters for, uh, for billing and payment. You have a, a, great, a much more flexibility and much more control over who you hire, what their qualifications are, and how much you pay them by going the self-directed option than by going through the more categorical and pro provider-driven and county-administered uh, traditional waiver plan. I do this presentation with a, with a colleague from Hennepin County, um, and he describes the difference between traditional waiver services and CDCS services as the difference between the restaurant model and the uh, supermarket model. The restaurant model is you get a menu, you go to the restaurant, you see their menu, there are 20 items on the menu, you pick items off the menu, they cook your meal, they bring it to you, you get the meal. You know, you have... You have choice, you can pick different things off the meal, you can have a salad or not, you can have a main entree, you could just do appetizers, you can get dessert, you can pick, but you have to pick the things that are on the menu and they cook it for you and they bring it to you. That's traditional waiver services. CDCS is the supermarket model. You've got a certain budget, you go to the supermarket, within that budget uh, and within the confines of what you can get in the supermarket, you decide what you're buying, how you're gonna put it together, what kind of meals you're gonna have and how often, 
and you really have much more control over and responsibility for making sure that you walk out of that supermarket with enough for your meal. Um, and that's a pretty good general way of, you know, metaphor for using the difference or describing the difference between regular waiver services and the CDCS option. Um, CDCS could be a training unto itself. And in fact, if you end up going through this whole gauntlet, uh, you establish medical assistance eligibility, you, get, you go through the min choices process and you're assessed for eligibility and you're told, yes, you can get PCA services, but congratulations, you're also eligible for a waiver. In fact, you're eligible for two different waivers, the CADI waiver and the DD waiver. There's a waiting list for the DD waiver, but we could put you on the CADI waiver right now. Or we could put you on either one, um, and here's the type of things that you could do under either one. Which one do you want? By the way, there's this self-directed option called CDCS. If you go that route, you would get access to this kind of budget under CADI or that kind of budget under DD. What would you like to do? That's a lot to try to digest. One of the things that most of the metro counties do, at least, um, and which is available to you through webinars uh, and that sort of thing, is um, a collection of consumer training materials. And there's a specific webinar and collection of materials that many of the counties require you to go to in order to choose the CDCS option. Um, and you can get access to that online and you can specifically read about the materials and, and the, the types of things you can do and would be required to do if you chose CDCS by clicking on this link here uh, and reviewing the consumer manual or consumer handbook that, uh, that's created by and, and maintained by the Department of Human Services. Um, within that, the, the one point that I'll point out about CDCS that helps to distinguish between that program and um, and uh, traditional waiver services is that there is a state budget formula that determines how much money you get access to. Based on assessment information, they take the screening information that's in the min choices or the DD screening or the other legacy document that they use to determine other eligibility for the other waivers. And they, pl they pull out specific information about your child and they spit it into the formula and that gives you an individualized budget amount, a not to exceed budget amount of, pick a number, uh, you know, $46,000. And that's the budget environment you're working within. You can't accept in limited circumstances that we won't get into now, we really don't have the time. There are some exceptions that were just recently passed in the most recent legislative session to help people get out of institutional settings and develop individualized housing options and employment options. There are some exceptions to the CDCS budget, but absent one of those exceptions, you're kind of stuck with that budget. The county doesn't really have the authority to change that budget amount. It's based on, you know, individual information that was obtained in the eligibility determination. That differs from traditional waiver services where the county really does have a fair amount of discretion to decide how much of a budget you're going to have. And so if they really think, given your particular family circumstances or your particular health care needs at the time, you need 10 more hours of X service, they can just authorize it. And, and within their total county allocation, they have the money available to them, they can authorize it. They don't need to get permission otherwise. Uh, it's very discretionary. You can't, whether you can force them to do that, that's a different question. Uh, but but you, you have more flexibility under the traditional waiver to expand the budget than you do under CDCS. However, you have much more flexibility in defining what you actually get and use for services under CDCS than the traditional budget. That's the trade-off. Okay. I hope that makes some sense. I know I'm, I'm dumping a lot of information on you guys, but again, part of what we're trying to do here is just issue spot and plant some seeds uh, uh, out there that can, that, can, that can grow. You can get more information about as you as you read through more of the information that's, that's in this PowerPoint and available online. So that's a, a broad overview of waivers. How do you get a waiver? We've talked a little bit about the process now. You go through the, the, the SMERT team, you get on medical assistance, you go through an assessment process, usually it's been choices, and you're told whether you're eligible or not for that waiver. Um, but simply meeting the eligibility requirements doesn't automatically answer the, the final question. It doesn't automatically lead to a, you know, a golden ticket. There is, a, there is an intermediate step that goes on at the county level to actually authorize and approve you for waiver services. Uh, and as we talked about, again, a county administered system you're dependent upon the county reviewing the results from that min choices assessment um, 
and, and determining, yes, the person's eligible for a waiver and we have waiver services available to them. So how do we get to that point? Um, let's just walk through that process because for those of you who have not been through that process, uh, it's fairly bureaucratic. You go to the county, if you have a child, you, you need to wind your way through to the children's services area of the county social services office. Most, many counties have a, an intake or an open door, front door number. I think in Hennepin County, it's a, it's a 411 number. Um, but you would call up the county social services office, say you have a child with a disability, tell them you want to get assessed for uh, social services programs, tell them you want to get assessed for a waiver, if that's what you're looking for. They will set up a, they will, they will refer that internally um, and have a certified assessor assigned to conduct a min choices assessment. Certified assessor is just a uh, professional who has been trained to do the min choices assessment, which is, as I think I mentioned earlier, it's a software-based, computerized, relatively comprehensive, person-centered assessment uh, and support planning tool. They go out there with a tablet or a laptop and they ask you a series of questions that are, that are um, organized into different modules, healthcare, uh, child module, mental health, um, health, uh, generally social services, and they go through the different modules and they get enough information to determine your eligibility for various programs. They, they go through this process. They can skip certain parts of it. If you, if you really know and are somewhat directive about what you're looking for, I'm only interested in PCA service, they can skip various other questions that are built into the assessment tool that help answer other eligibility questions that wouldn't be relevant to you. Um, in most cases, based on that, the basic personal information, they will be able to skip parts. So they're not going to ask you, they're not going to do the brain injury assessment if you have no history of brain injury. They'll skip those questions, those pages of the assessment. But even with that said, one of the fundamental shortcomings of putting it, a comprehensive assessment together and, and trying to do a one-stop shop is that it takes time. And if you talk to counties, they, they will almost, almost uniformly grumble about the fact that these things take two to three hours at the, at the short end to complete for a first-time assessment to get all the basic background information and then check on the person's ongoing eligibility if they're, if they're, uh, if they're being reassessed. That process, because it is so time consuming um, and because it's not the most transparent, is currently undergoing some changes. So people who have gone through the Mint Choices Assessment, you know, have had the joy of going through the Mint Choices Assessment, um, you could see some changes as early as next, middle of next year because there's a, a work group at DHS right now that, that's trying to streamline the assessment tool. Um, so you get the Mint Choices Assessment. They, they go through, as we discussed, this, these different categories of information. Um, to determine your support and service needs. I'm going to skim through some of this here. Uh, how is eligibility determined? It ultimately depends on the program you're looking for and the type of disability or health condition you have. If you have a child with a developmental disability and you're going for not just PCA services, but a developmental, a DD waiver, they have to ask a series of questions that are aimed at filling out the DD screening form, the DD eligibility form. And that eligibility form asks two sets of questions. One is to determine whether your child has a developmental disability, and that, that's a, it's a medical slash social service team, a term that's defined under federal and state law, or whether the child has not, not something that doesn't qualify as a developmental disability, but which meets the legal definition of this legal term, a related condition. If you ask a doctor what's a related condition to a developmental disability, the doctor's not going to be able to tell you. It's not a medical term. It's a legal social services term. But it's two prongs of the eligibility test to see if you're eligible for DD services generally and ultimately if you're eligible for the DD waiver. Um, not everybody who, the, who has what the doctor would say is a developmental disability will qualify as, as meeting this standard. There are people with an autism spectrum diagnosis who have what we used to call high-functioning autism, you know, they might have a very specific functional limitation, but it's not broad enough, and they won't otherwise or ultimately be eligible as a person with a developmental disability or a related condition, even though autism is routinely thought of as a related condition to or a developmental disability. It really does ask not just diagnostically what's your, what's your condition, what, have you, what label has a doctor given you, uh, but functionally, how does it, how does it affect your... Um, your development, how does it affect your ability to interact with others in your environment? 
and there are choices, or there are questions built into the min choices assessment that are pulled out of those original screening tools um, that the assessor gathers and then ultimately get reviewed by a qualified professional, a QDDP, Qualified Developmental Disabilities Professional uh, within the county. It's a second step, an add-on step to the min choices assessment tool that needs to be done in part because those certified assessors are not all developmental disability specialists. Some of them are nurses. Uh, some of them are social workers who don't have a developmental disabilities background, so they're not as well qualified to assess the information that they gather to determine whether you meet the DD eligibility standards. But that goes on largely behind the scenes. They get the information, they go through the DD uh, requirements and the, or the related conditions checklist, and they ultimately come back and tell you, yes, you're eligible, or no, you're not. If you're not, they're supposed to walk through what, what aspects of it did they conclude uh, you didn't meet, what, what eligibility requirements didn't you meet. Because they might be wrong about that. And you might say, oh, and, you know, I forgot to give you this information, uh, which can cause them to reevaluate and change the eligibility determination. Okay, so we're not going to go through a lot of this. If people have specific questions about DD eligibility, you can, you can walk through these slides. Um, we don't use the term, doctors might still use it, we don't, for social services pur purposes, we don't use the term mental retardation anymore, we use developmental disability. The underlying standards and requirements are the same that they have been for the last, you know, 30 or 40 years. Um, but it's important to note that there are specific standards built into the law for social services eligibility that can differ from clinical standards, from what your doctor might use, and can differ, differ from what the school might use to determine um, whether you have a a 504 accommodation plan at school or, or an, um, an IEP, a uh, special education plan. Um, they all have slightly different overlapping, similar, but slightly different standards that they apply. Okay, and then this goes through the, the eligibility requirements for a related condition. If you, if you have a developmental disability or related condition, does that get you to waiver eligibility? So we've looped back around. Remember, my answer before was not quite. It doesn't quite get you there. Why? You have the right kind of disability, but you still need to meet those other basic requirements for waiver eligibility. You've got to be on medical assistance. Remember, with waivers are a medical assistance program. So you've got to loop back around. If this is the first time you've walked into the county, the county might be doing the min choices assessment and determining whether you have a DD as part of that, whether you have DD or a related condition as part of that assessment. But they still need to be asking whether you're on medical assistance. If you're not, they've got to get you started through the SMERT process, and that's got to go on parallel tracks. Hopefully, it will go expeditiously and it, you'll get an answer back from SMERT about the same time that you get answers back from the min choices assessment. In many cases, SMERT takes longer. So even though they're ready to go with their min choices results and they'd like to create that, the temporary plan that gets created at the end of the min choices assessment, the community services and support plan, they hold off on that because they don't know whether you're medical assistance eligible. And they don't, they don't want to make a final decision about your eligibility for the waiver program if they haven't determined your medical assistance eligibility, because you're not eligible for the waiver if you're not eligible for medical assistance. So they need to get that question answered. You need to get a medical assistance, and then what's the other thing you need to show? And ultimately, to get to the waiver, we talked about this, you need to show that you don't just have the right kind of disability, but you, you have the level of care need that's provided for under the waiver. So for the DD waiver, it's that, it's that developmental need, the habilitative need, the, the intermediate care facility DD level of care need. For the other waivers, um, it's the nursing home or hospital level of care need. And you could get to a nursing home level of care need if you have a developmental disability and something else that meets a nursing facility level of care. It could be mental health issues, it could be physical issues. DD usually, the cognitive issues underlying a DD diagnosis don't typically qualify you for nursing facility level of care, but other things added to it could, which is how a person with a developmental disability could end up potentially being allowed to choose between say a CADI waiver and a DD waiver. Okay. Um, what if you don't meet that DD requirement? What if you thought that you were gonna, your child was gonna uh, be eligible as a person with a developmental disability, but isn't for some reason? Uh, and you agree, you know what? Once you walk through that process and they explain their decision making to you, you realize, okay, I, I don't quite meet that. My child doesn't quite meet that. You can still look at other questions. You can still get access to other services. Remember, PCA services are not disability specific. The other waivers do not require um, a, a disability-specific diagnosis. CADI and CAC are two that are not disability-specific. If you can show that you have, you, you have a combination of conditions that are eligible, that would make you eligible for CADI, that could be the door that you ultimately go through. 
There are other types of services that people with other disabilities might also get access to, county level social services, um, and also significantly children's mental health services. There are a number of, there's an entirely different service system that we can get to in a, in a little bit. I, I don't know if we'll, we'll probably run out of time. Um, but there are slides here that talk about children's mental health services, children's therapeutic services and supports, and behavioral aids that are available to kids who have what would qualify as an emotional behavioral disturbance. Um, and there's some overlap there as well. Again, kids on the autism spectrum ultimately could be eligible for children's mental health services and uh, services through the uh, uh, Developmental Disability Services Unit at the county. Okay. Um, once you're determined eligible, as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, Min Choices generates a community service and support plan. That plan identifies specific types of services and programs that you could choose from among, um, including PCA services, including waivers. In order to get to that waiver, the final step is that the county needs to decide, do we have waiver funds available to meet your need? Uh, most recently, you, you, you might have heard that there's been, that there've been a lot of efforts to try to get people off of waiting lists uh, for waivers and on to the waivers themselves. For the CADI waiver, for two or three years, there was a waiting list. There no longer is a waiting list for the CADI waiver. If you live in a county and you're told through the min after the min choices process that you're eligible for the CADI waiver, but unfortunately they don't have any available for you and you have to go on a waiting list, that's wrong. You, <laughs> you need to tell them that's wrong. You need to ultimately call our office if that's the answer you're getting. There's no longer a CADI waiver waiting list. You should not be running into that problem anymore as of the middle of last year. Um, end of last year. For the DD waiver, they're making progress. Um, there are, if you are not in crisis, um, if you have not lost your home or your caregiver, um, and you're not coming out of an institutional setting, those groups, for the most part, are, if they're eligible for the, for the DD waiver, they are, getting, they are being authorized for the DD waiver, and they are getting access to the DD waiver. For those groups, the big question is, can I find providers that I need? Can I, are there providers out there with enough staff who will come into my home and give me the hours of care that I need in order to stay in my home or get out of the institutional setting? But getting authorization for the waiver is not the problem. The problem right now is, while there's still a fair amount of money out there to serve people who are eligible for the waiver, for that group whose, um, whose individuals, their, their, their children or they themselves, are eligible for the waiver and they need the waiver, but they're not in crisis. Um, they're just they're, they're having tri trouble accessing, uh, you know, supportive services, vocational services, transportation services, uh, and so they're stuck. They're stuck in their home. They're not able to access their community. They're not getting the quality of services they'd like to have. It's a little more hit or miss. Um, some counties, depending on how well they've done in managing their budgets, are putting everyone onto the DD waiver. Other counties still have a wait list. Uh, and it really, it requires some individual advocacy at that point to try to push the counties along and make sure that you're not stuck on that waiting list for too long in order to get access to the DD waiver. But that's only the DD waiver. Every other waiver, if you're eligible for it, you should be able to get authorization for those waiver services and get on the path of finding providers to provide services. I hope that makes sense. That's a bit of a truncated, that's another half an hour presentation I could give, but we just don't have time today. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the landscape out there. Once the county says you're eligible for the waiver, they assign a case manager to you. It could be a county worker, it could be a private contracted case manager, and that person helps walk you through the options. Are you going the consumer directed route? Here's what you need to do. Um, otherwise, here's the service planning form that we use. We need to start identifying specific types of services and the amount of those services and figure out who the providers are gonna be for those services and get a service plan in place. Ultimately, you develop that written plan of care. The county approves it and says yes, Budgetarily it fits, and yes, it is well designed to meet your existing service needs, and then they authorize it and off you go. That's, that's how you get to the waivers. Um, we don't really have a lot of time to talk about everything else that's in here, but I got through about 75% of this. Carolyn, we've got maybe six, seven minutes. I can stay on for a little bit longer if you want to answer questions. Do we have questions? We do. We have a few questions. Uh, one is just related to what you just discussed related to the DD waiver. Is it beneficial to be to get yourself on the waiting list if there is one in your county? Um, yes. Uh, right now, there's a new there's a new process that DHS started to use at the very end of 2015 as part of uh, the state's Olmstead plan. We haven't talked about the Olmstead plan, but it's a it's a grand social services. Um, 
state services plan to help ensure that people get services in their communities in the most integrated setting consistent with their needs and they don't um, otherwise experience unnecessary isolation, segregation, they don't get unnecessarily institutionalized. Consistent with that plan, they came up, they identified a problem with how we uh, create, maintain, and regulate waiting lists for the waivers. And the problem was we don't know of the people who are on those waiting lists how urgent their need is for services. Is this someone who got their five-year-old onto the waiting list because they think when the five-year-old leaves high school, they, they want to get access to these services, so they just want to get their ticket and make sure they're in line? That's not a particularly urgent need. That's different from the person who's going in and out of the hospital and wants to stay out of the hospital and is experiencing crisis after crisis. Right? That's, a, that's a person who has a need today, has a need yesterday. How do we distinguish among those? So they have a new urgency of need assessment tool that they use. It puts you into one of four categories, basically. Um, institutional need, you're in an institution, you need to get out. Um, immediate need, you're in crisis, um, and you need access to services or something bad is going to happen. You're going to go into an institution, something bad is happening. Um, and for both of those categories, the system right now is supposed to find that you're eligible and authorize services. They are not supposed to put you on a waiting list anywhere in any county. Is it happening? It's happening a little bit, um, but at least in most counties they're saying, yeah, you're authorized for the waiver, but we got some steps we got to jump through. We got to know who the providers are first before we get you into waiver services. But that's where the glitch is. It's not the administrative step of, no, we're not even authorizing you. We're not putting you name, your name down for the waiver. So for those categories, you should get authorization for the waiver. It's the defined need where we're still seeing a waiting list backlog in some, not all, but in some counties. Um, and those are the people who are eligible but just want to use it for you know, quality of life issues. I don't mean to minimize it. I'm just saying they're not in crisis. And so they're eligible. They have an unmet service need, but we don't have unlimited resources. The waivers, unlike other services under the state plan, can be limited in terms of how much money is spent at the state level and how many people are served. Um, historically, the state has appropriated more money than has been spent, which is why we complained. We actually sued them over this um, because they, they were letting money disappear. They were le letting money go to waste every year and just end up going back to the state general fund ultimately instead of using it to serve people who are eligible and were waiting for no particularly good reason other than administrative roadblocks. That's the group, the people who are in the defined group who still have a waiting list. And yes, I would say it does make sense to go through the process and at least make sure that the county has identified you as somebody who is eligible for the waiver and is currently waiting because it affects all kinds of decision making upstream by DHS and by the legislature. They need to know that there's a, that there's a pent up demand for this, that there's a backlog for this. If your name isn't there, they think, oh, there isn't really a need for more services. We'll move on to other things, roads, schools, you know, tax rebates, whatever it is. But they need to know that this is still, you know, that there's still demand for these services that's going unmet. Um, and ultimately, you want the county to know that you're waiting because they might not, they might put you on a wait list this month, but in three months they might call you back and say, you know what, we've got money to serve your needs. Or by the next time you have an assessment, um, your name comes, you know, pops up to the top of the list. The dirty little secret about waiting lists is that they're not really seniority based. It's not like getting in line at the supermarket at Disney World and once you get to the front of the line, you're next on ride and the ride, or you get to the cashier next. It's more of a waiting pool. Everybody who's eligible is in this pool of people waiting, and then you get picked off for a variety of reasons. You have providers available. You know, the house that you're trying to move into is available, so you're coming on instead of your neighbor, even though your neighbor's been waiting two months later. We think that's still a glitch in the system, but that's really how it's working. So you do want to at least have your name out there in the county and, and make sure that the county knows about you. That fourth group that I mentioned are, are the group of people who are identified as being otherwise eligible. You have the right disability, but you don't have a current need for waiver services. Your need is more than a year out. So we're not going to put you, we're not going to say you have an urgent need, and in fact, we're not going to put you on the waiting list. And we're going to wait until you come back the next time for an assessment to relook at things. That, that's a problem group. They've put a lot of people into that category. We think inappropriately so because they think that their needs are being met otherwise, and we think that there is a lot of discrepancy going on at the county level about what constitutes current need for service and what, what doesn't. Um, anyway, yes, the, the, that's a long answer to a short question. Yes, I think it still makes sense to go in, um, get assessed, and, and if you are eligible and told we've we got to put you on a waiting list, get on the waiting list and then just be a squeaky wheel. 
If you really, if you really think you do have a current need and you're missing something, call them periodically to find out how the waiting list is moving. Or call Thank us you. to give you some help. So another question that came up is, is there any flexibility with parental fees? Um, not, not from a, not, not in terms of discretion or, not in terms of discretion to ignore stuff. It, it's pretty um, regimented or, or fairly strictly delineated. What counts uh, for income and for assets, what doesn't count, there, there is some gray area, so it's, it's, it's worthwhile to go through the worksheet and then follow up with the county if you think that they are inappropriately counting something. There are a number of groups that end up having problems with the parental fee issue. People who are self-employed, people who have episodic or inconsistent income, it can be difficult. There are guidelines for how to treat that, uh, and sometimes those guidelines get followed correctly or less correctly, and that can impact what they tell you your fee is. Um, in that respect, there's some flexibility in how you look at things. But for the most part, and there is a hardship provision uh, that can apply, uh, there are certain standards for the hardship, but generally speaking, no, they, they sort of plug it in and they don't want there to be a lot of discretion at the county level because then you end up with wildly divergent, inconsistent, and frankly, inequitable results. But there, if you have questions, there are, there are actually staff at, the, at DHS who are um, dedicated to looking at parental fee issues and it's worthwhile tracking them down and talking with them about it if you think there's been an error made. Great, thank you. Um, you know, we are at 1.30 now and I, I know that um, some people need to leave. And uh, I just want to mention that we will be sending out the slides again. But um, if you have the chance to stay on for just a couple more minutes, I think there were two other questions that would be maybe helpful to address if you have time, Bud. Sure. Uh, one question was related to the length of time for this for the application process for MA, or medical assistance, and um, whether or not um, the, um, your eligibility, or not your eligibility, but when your program starts goes back to when you apply. Um, going, for medical assistance purposes, yes. For medical assistance purposes, it does. It can go back actually to cover um, eligible expenses up to three months prior to the application time. That's generally speaking for medical assistance. One of the, it can, it can get tricky depending on what the specific program you're talking about. Um, so let's just say it's medical assistance and it was speech therapy you were trying to get access to. And you went to speech therapy and you had to pay out of pocket and the application took a long time, but it did finally get established. You are eligible. It was a covered expense. You can go back and pay for that speech therapy up to three months prior to the application time. State, uh, regular state plan medical assistance kind of service. But for other programs like the waiver programs, I was providing uh, daily care to my child. And now I, you know, I'm finally, I've finally been approved for medical assistance. I'm finally on the waiver. I'm choosing the CDCS option. I am hiring myself as one of the staff people and providing parental pay uh, services to provide disability related care to my child and I'd like to get reimbursed for all the time that I didn't get paid for up to three months prior to the application being approved. You're not going to get that. It's really forward looking um, and they, there's no administrative process for going back and authorizing payment for services that were not at that point authorized. At that point they just look at it and say well, that's, that's parental care. You really can't get access to that because your, your eligibility for billing and to, for getting reimbursed doesn't start until you're actually on the waiver and operating under a written plan of care. So it depends on the service type, there, and it depends on how the, the, the question pops up, but generally speaking, for regular medical assistance uh, services, it can go back three months prior to the application. Great, thank you. So the one last question that um, came up is related to CDCS parent pay. Is it tax exempt or is it taxable income? And that's a question I think that seems to pop up quite often. 
Yeah. Um, well, the standard lawyer response is, I'm not, you know, I'm not a tax attorney and I can't give you specific tax advice, right? You have to get that disclaimer out uh, right away. But I can tell you what we understand from having received circulars uh, about this from the IRS is that there is a, an IRS bulletin, and Carolyn, I could probably track that down and forward it to you. But there's a, an IRS bulletin that says for um, self-directed options like CDCS, um, under waiver programs, they treat them like difficulty of care payments uh, under foster care, and they do not treat that as earned income. In other words, it should not be taxable income. And I can get you that. If there are questions about the scope and when that applies, and does that apply to all self-directed options? It's not at all clear. There are other types of self-directed options. For example, one of the slides that we didn't get to talks about the consumer support grant, which is a way of doing CDCS-like services, um, but it uses, it's not through a waiver program. It uses your home care dollars, your PCA authorization or your nursing authorization, and allows you to cash that out and self-direct. And you can pay yourself under that. We do not have clarification from the IRS that that program, even though it looks and smells a lot like CDCS, falls under the IRS guidelines and is not taxable. Should be from a policy standpoint, we don't have clarification that it is. That's where you'd really need to probably consult with a tax attorney. But there is some IRS guidance that suggests that CDCS parent pay should not be taxable. I'll get that out to, I'll get that out to you, Carolyn. That would be great. Well, we've, we've gone about six minutes over time, but I really want to thank you, Bud, for taking all this time today to present this information. This has been very, very helpful. And I know we've had a few people that have dropped out and, and um, have said that this was great. So I want to thank you again, and we will be following up with everyone who we, whose questions we didn't get to, and also um, we will send out the slides and the additional information that Bud just discussed. So Great. thanks, everyone. I appreciate all of uh, you participating, and thanks, Bud. Great. Thanks for letting me address everyone. It's, it's always helpful to, to get out and about and share whatever information we have. It can be helpful at all. Well, thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you.